I'm Rick Miller, and welcome to Xing the Gap. In Xing the Gap, I'm not the performer, but the host of an intergenerational conversation between a baby boomer and a millennial. Sometimes we break the rules and go younger or older, but the goal is always the same, to discover how differently we see things, but that together we can build bridges of understanding, find a shared humanity, and save the world from itself. Boom. In today's episode, my two guests are Mary Walsh and Jamie Pitt, who bring us perspective from Newfoundland. Mary is one of Canada's most recognized comedians, a founding member of CODCO and This Hour is 22 Minutes, and a prolific writer, producer, and performer. Jamie was a student of Mary's, then her executive assistant, and has since gone on to become a successful casting director, editor, and educator. In our wonderful chat, we discover that Newfoundlanders tend to do things their own way. We talk about younger generations, gender and intersectionality, underrepresentation of older women in Canadian culture, about wisdom, looking under the hood of who we are, about hurtful words, heartfelt conversations with sisters and brothers and aunts, and how even the most rigid families can still change their ways. All that and much, much more, including watching a Canadian legend get her butt whooped in a game show. Don't blame everything on Star Wars, Mary Walsh. My friends, it's time for... Xing the Gap. First of all, Mary and Jamie, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thanks. Can you each describe yourselves, a little, you know, elevator pitch, who I am, what I do? Maybe we'll start with you, Mary. Well, I met Jamie because she was my student um, at, uh, I, my husband uh, was a um, an English prof at the university since retired, but uh, Memorial University has this satellite campus in Harlow in England. And I went along teaching, um, Don was teaching 18th century uh, English, and I went along teaching satire and theater. So really what we got to do was go to the theater all the time. And, um, and Jamie was one of the students. And I was, I don't know if you know this, Rick, but lots of people get into university and are in third year English and don't know what any words that they're using mean and don't know how to write a sentence. Like like a paragraph is so far. And I, I understand there's reasons for that, but I was in shock because I, I'd only read, you know, for pleasure and read things that were written that you could understand. But there were people who were in Jamie's class who I didn't understand what, it, they were speaking another language, a language that I had no access to. And, but Jamie was uh, quite brill and, uh, you know, knew what all the words meant and uh, was very, very impressive and worked really hard, which I really found impressive too. And because lots of people just went over to Harlow, like, because you get access to Poland and France and you know what I mean? It's like for poor kids from Newfoundland or not poor, but, you know, lower middle class or middle class. And, you know, they got to do the grand tour like people who were rich used to do, you know, in the in the 20th century. So anyway, that's how I met Jamie. And I was so impressed with her and uh, just uh, she was just an amazing person, not just as a student, but as a human being. And um I just was really, uh, yeah, taken with her. And my name is Mary Walsh, and I don't usually teach because I'm not really that good at teaching. Uh, but I did do it, and uh, I, I'm a comedian and a writer and a producer, and you know all those jobs. I, I'm a jack of all trades uh, in the entertainment business, and um, I'm not going to say master of none. I think there's some things that I do better than others. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, that's who I am. Terrific. Jamie, over to you. Oh, my God. Okay, so I hi, I'm Jamie. Um, I met Mary. Yes, I was her student uh, in Harlow. And she was the main reason that I went because I got to take British drama and performance and creative writing satire with Mary Walsh. And I'd loved her my whole life. And I even Mary, I don't know if you know this. I went to the airport to pick up my dad. And you were there to pick up Don when I was like nine. And I remember shaking seeing I couldn't even say hello <laughs> but I'm like Don and I was like I love her so much I love her so much and then I was like oh I'm taking that course I'm going to England to go to the theater with Mary Walsh every we went to London honestly almost every day and um and I can't believe she's saying she's not a good teacher she's a great teacher but she definitely breaks the classroom and breaks you know a traditional top-down model and like our most of our assignments for 
the British Drama and Performance course was writing reviews, which is a totally different kind of critique and commercial and pop culture type of writing that I didn't have any opportunity to do really up to that point. And she broke my writing in a really good way, saying, you know, this is all intellectually thought out and it has, but where is the, where's the blood? You know, where is, where is your real human thoughts about the play in the, in the review? Anyway, we had a ball. And then I, a year later, Mary was, I was in my final year university. Mary was looking for uh, an executive assistant, executive assistant. It was personal assistant. I call it executive. And it was a ball. And like, we went to Arizona and I worked on a trillion things with her and got to just help her create for a few years. And now we just remain really good friends. And I just, and she's like my therapist too. And like my mom and like my fun aunt and my fun sister in a way, you know, I'm little sister to her sometimes. And I think she's little sister to me sometimes in a really, in a really sweet way. And I'm, um, I work in the film industry primarily right now. I work in casting and uh, I write and I perform and, you know, kind of, wear a lot of hats and sometimes teach first year English lit also. Both Mary and Jamie wear a lot of hats. Their identity and careers are fluid, which is more typical with millennials than with baby boomers because baby boomers were a generation raised by boxes. You lived in a box, you drove in a box, you worked in a box, you ate from a box while watching a box. And that box had glossy pictures of happiness and leisure and post-war prosperity, as long as you stayed on track. School, job, marriage, house, kids, pets, retirement. And yes, some boomers rebelled against the system in the late 60s, but many of them were happy to fall into it because it worked for them. It's still working for them. And when you're riding on that track, comfy in your box, it seems like the only way to travel through life. I asked Jamie, a millennial, if things are different for her generation. I would say it definitely is. And Mary's generation would really be the generation that raised my generation. And I know in my own relationship with my parents, I mean, Mary, th- thinking generation, generationally, I think about expectations about work, sorry, that, and Mary, I don't want to speak to you. I don't, you don't subscribe to that, nor have you ever, but definitely my parents, I feel, uh, they're, they are surprised how long it's taking, say, people of my generation to get it together. Uh, And I I definitely, um, but I'm more open to that it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride or that it's more about the journey. But my parents, I think, are take maybe more of a common generational stance on that, that, you know, that ye aren't uh, uh, working hard enough or you're not uh, applying yourselves or, you know, they're just so panicked. They're freaked. But I know, I'd love to know what Mary thinks about that, too. Mary, what do you think about that? Well, in in theater, you know, there was nothing, uh, you know, and then we created it. So we and then we had to do everything, you know, we had to write it and then we had to put find a place to put it on and then we had to produce it. And then and so that was the way it always was. So there was no expectation from my generation of Newfoundland artists anyway. And really, I mean, come on, uh, you know, w- I, I was going to Ryerson and uh, you know, Paul Thompson at Theatre Paz Marai gave us $300 to write our own first show of uh, Cod on a Stick for Codco. And, you know, they were creating before that, really, in Canada, in this business, in the entertainment business, there were only little theatres. And so there was no theatre. There was nobody, you know, now I I know that, uh, you know, people audition for the great artistic directors and blah, 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 and all that. And you hope to get in. I'm always hoping Jamie's going to cast me, which he never does. But, um, bastard. Uh, but but uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, there was nobody to do it. There was nobody to look to, to give you a job. There was no job to go to. You had to create it. And my father's generation, my father said that that was always the way in Newfoundland. You had to create everything. You had to create the tools. There was nothing coming in. We're an island. You know, he said that when the Americans came in the 40s, that Newfoundland men who had never seen electricity pretended that they were electricians and then they just did it. You know what I mean? They did it. So I don't, I don't find that there's much of a difference between myself and Jamie in those ways of our expectations about if we do the right thing now, then we'll naturally go on to this and then we'll get in with this crowd. And then, you know what I mean? That sure. it just never existed and it doesn't now. So for me, it, but I didn't work for IBM, and uh, I think it was a big shock for people who worked for IBM. That 
Why? The world is, is better off that you didn't work for IBM, Mary. <laughs> I think it's probably safe to say. What is something that you find, maybe it's in a university context or generally, that um, younger generations see differently from older generations? And I can, I'm a Gen X, so I, I consider myself an older generation. I have two daughters who are 19 and 14 who are considered Gen Z. Uh, I can list a, a bunch of things that I think younger people are educating older people about. And vice versa, I think it goes both ways. So I'll start with you, Jamie. If you could think of something that is fundamentally different about a younger generation's perspective on things. Well, I'll, I think even like I'm looking to the I, the younger generation beneath me now, and they're learning and sharing, you know, on the wide, terrifying world that is the internet. But they're they're sharing things that I only encountered in like my third year feminist theory class and stuff like that. And in from that kind of information has, though I know there's a long way to go, is reaching more and more people. Not information, just ways of ways of being. And I'm so, I think, you know, kids I know, I taught theater to two kids for a long time and kids that I taught when they were eight or now and like finishing high school or in high school and the things they just know and are and feel empowered to say and speak and understand are really amazing. Like, I, I think Oscar Wilde would be, he would be, he would die again to know how far we are taking the creation of the individual, at least in kind of this context and like, in this context, they'll say this historical moment. And, you know, I know that's different across so many different identities, but Everyone is really about the creation of the, not just the individual and, and communities, but like, you know, who we are. They're, they're not afraid to look under the hood. And that's something Mary actually really isn't afraid of. I know it's a scary process, but in terms of what I learned from the young, younger generation, they're looking under the hood. And Mary in her generation now is really looking under the hood too. I'm just really afraid to. I'm trying to. So... Yeah, I think, I don't know. I, I think it's about really a sense that you can be who you want to be and that the personal is political. And I mean, it was, it was definitely already happening when Mary was growing up in my age and younger, but I just see it so much more with the internet. I can just see people creating themselves and being really brave about it that I find amazing. And Mary, what's under the hood? What are you, what are you finding? Well, you know, it doesn't seem to me that things are any different. Our surfaces are different. Like Jamie taught me, you know, like I used to say the word retarded. Uh, you know, I used to say it and then Jamie used to always say, I wish you wouldn't say that. And then I stopped saying it. But you know why I stopped saying it? She taught me that that would hurt someone, that they would hear that word that and then that would hurt them. And that's what I learned from Jamie. And I learned that I had no interest in hurting someone just because I always said that word, it seemed like a useful word. It just means slow in French, you know, why is uh, developmentally delayed any better? But at the risk of hurting someone, I don't, I don't care. I don't want to say that. I mean, I don't want to do that. But, you know, Jamie and I both have very difficult mothers and we are the product of that, you know, as we are all the product of our mothers, whether be they, I think mothers, mother monster, you know, it's always, it's too big a job for any, any human being to take on to be a mother. And so, you know, a lot of things that Jamie and I, though there's 40 years between us, I think that under the hood, we're all exactly the same as we were 2000 years ago, as we were 40 years ago, as we were, you know. Under the hood, we're all exactly the same. From a biological point of view, absolutely. From a sociological point of view though, our experiences of the world can be incredibly different and that can put up walls between generations. What makes the walls even higher is our use of technology where algorithms curate our experience and lead us to completely different versions of reality. The real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. I didn't write that, the sociologist E.O. Wilson did. Our paleolithic emotions, what's under the hood, were designed for the Stone Age, not the Information Age. We weren't designed to be able to turn off our emotions. We were designed to create offspring. My, I have a twin brother, and it's been 
interesting to walk through life with him from the perspective of a, you know, cisgendered white, you know, upper middle class man. And he's my twin. And we, you know, lived life French immersion from kindergarten all the way. And we did the same degrees, basically. Uh, not gender studies, though. And he he really right now is is finding these little codes for the world well that's per that person's acting that way because they're of scottish ancestry and that's how scott and like he's really kind of plugging in codes and he is not all the time he's trying to understand the world in his way but he sometimes is very okay boomer you know and then it's full stop and i think we always always need to see everyone in their complexity and my brother definitely right now i think he's just i think he's very angry at the type of values that my parents were raised with in their, um, you know, in their socioeconomic class. Like, I think he's just really angry at the iteration of masculinity he got. He's really pissed. He's really pissed. My dad would pass that on. And my dad is a very open person. Who it is? You do have to have like a yelling match at the kitchen table sometimes to get there. My dad really can learn. I don't. My experience isn't that that older folks can't learn at all. It never ever is that. But. I know people of my generation do feel that. And it's just about patience. They just don't, people are so just like, I don't want to hear it. You know, I, it's easier for me to pop you in that box and go, okay, boomer. And it's uh, uh, not helpful, I think. Uh, Mary, I'll throw it over to you. But with the, the added point that I find in my last few years, especially doing this trilogy of shows where I'm trying to connect generations together and to find that generational distinctions ultimately aren't helpful at all. We are just human beings under the, under the hood, as we said before. I guess learning comes from listening for me, as opposed to just talking my way through it. Do you find that at all? Because you're someone who's been very expressive your, your entire life. You've, you, that's what you do for a living. I, I find it hard. I was just working with someone else and, uh, and I was just you know, so I had just learned something and I was telling Monique and then I w noticed about halfway through the conversation that I wasn't letting Monique answer, you know, even though I was saying, I really like to know what you think about this, Monique, because I'll tell you yesterday, you know, like, and I was just like, so I have that, but I wouldn't say that that's an age problem. That is my own personal um, character defect that I, because here's the thing that's always worked for me is I don't know what I think until I say it. And then I'll say it and then I'll go, oh, that's not, I don't know. Really. But my life has been ruined uh, to a certain degree by always thinking about what the other person was going to think and never taking the opportunity. And I don't know if that's a generational thing or an Irish Catholic alcoholic thing, or you know what I mean? Like, what is that, you know, you know? I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for you. I come from an Irish Catholic background as well, and there's a bit of alcoholism in my, my family too. Yeah. I, I honestly don't know, but I have had this desire to be loved and to be seen through the prism of others all the time, which, which makes me, you know, I can't touch politics in the sense that I can't become a politician because immediately half the people will hate you and myself could not tolerate you know that. Say, when I used to do, Mark, people used to say, get into politics, I'd go, I would just be crying all the time. And I stayed up all night to try to hear the machines in those schools and now they're staying. You know what I mean? I just couldn't take it. I couldn't take that I'd be doing all this work and there'd be no applause and no awards and, and people would be just saying, you know, how could I just, she's so ugly and she didn't get the thing done. And I mean, who would choose to be a politician? Yeah. I know that we... You know, we went too far. We always go too far one way and then we go too far the other way, right? Yeah. See? Yeah. So, Jamie, like in the sense of delight, and we talked a lot about love and, and compassion, these aren't things that normally get associated with our new technology, with social media, which is still relatively new. It's all a big social experiment in my mind to see how it's all going to pan out. But the internet, safe to say, is not how people envisioned it as this utopia of democracy. It's become this... Uh, you know, these echo chambers often of hate and anger. And when people filter, like being angry is natural and it's, it's good. But if you filter everything through anger, then there, there's very little love or compassion or kindness or delight. How do you use social media, Jamie, a lot? 
And do you find that you're, you can use it and it can be used to push the values forward that you think are important? I'm wrestling with that question. I don't know yet. We are completely in the great experiment of having more information, more communication, more. I, I don't know. It's like with Bo Burnham, you know, every a little bit of everything all of the time. And I don't know what it's going to mean. I know that my generation was raised, was babysat by the internet. I actually had a great babysitter, Paula. Love you. You babysat me and loved me and cared for me. Sorry. But we, I mean, I think sometimes how much more of my effing life is going to be spent searching for something here that is already, you know, I need to go down my own Google, you know, I need to go into my own search engine, but I, I don't know what it's going to mean. And how do I use social media? I think I really want social media. I want to get away from it because I feel like I've given so much of my life to it aimlessly. Now I have ADHD and it's not great for me. It's it's quick, instant, relentless dopamine hits until I'm fatigued of even that. I think the instant scroll, I mean the, you know, uh, what is it called? Eternal scrolling is not good for me. And my precious minutes of my little short shitty life are just ooh, just going down the drain. So I love that, by the way, the precious minutes of my short shitty life. Like that's <laughs> yeah. either a poem that's or a song idea. or a play. I don't know. To be continued. To be continued. Is there something you feel you would like the other to know in that you haven't shared yet? Well, can you get emotional? I'm really afraid of Mary. Sorry, Mary. I'm really afraid of Mary dying. I just don't ever want her to die. I just, she's not near death in any way, but I just, she just got you so much to more bring that up. I'm sorry. <laughs> dead before midnight. Jamie killed her. <laughs> I really care about what you think and feel every day. I love to know what you think about everything. I just, just get it out. I'm like, I'm just like, Mary. I know that you are doing that, but it, I want to say to you, it really matters to me and to so many people what you do think. Um, yeah, as an artist, I, you really you really matter. <laughs> That's what I want to say. Well, you can see why I'm friends with Jamie. I mean, that really matters so much to me because as a person, of course, as all people, we're so insecure and we think it doesn't matter. And, you know, I tried to get in the Halifax uh, comedy um, sh um, um, uh, festival and I just got turned down yesterday and they said, you know, because we want to have underrepresented, um, we want to, uh, we need more underrepresented people, which, you know, I'm not against that, but who is the most underrepresented people? Who are the most underrepresented people on Canadian television today? Old women, whether, no matter what their race, creed or color is like other countries, they have old women apparently in Great Britain, but we don't have any in, in Canada. They don't exist in any of our stories apparently there's lots of old men old men are on there but you just don't see old women i don't know where we went so you know i just get mad about that and then i think uh you know and i go down that sookie uh, uh, uh sookie hole uh where i think you know nobody loves me everybody hates me i'm gonna eat some worms and so um you know it really uh it really means so much to me uh that uh, that jamie would care what i think because of course jamie has been we've been working together for years and sometimes what i think uh having uh, you know i I think uh, I'll have to be careful, I'll say to someone, to say this, because Jamie took uh, gender uh, courses at university. And I have a degree. Sometimes I thought Jamie was going too far. But I have a brother who my character, Dakey Dunn, that uh, hardly exists anymore, but he was a very on woke guy, but he was very smart. And it was based on a lot of guys who I tragically dated, and also my brother. And the other day, <laughs> We had an argue. We were starting to argue, and I t kind of decided not to argue with him. But I said he was talking about uh, he had been home watching Fox News, and he was talking about Haiti, and he was saying, "And now the poor Americans are going to have to have all these people from Haiti in there, and they're going to have to pay them their pensions and stuff like that." And I said, "I don't know, but I 
um, you know, I read this thing about Haiti and the Americans basically, you know, left Haiti, destroyed Haiti from top to bottom without even a half of inch of topsoil left. And they have done nothing but harm there. And if a few Haitians had to come in and get a pension, that would be the very least. And I tried to say it in a calm kind of way, which I'm not doing now. And and I and my brother went, hold on, hold on. I, I'm starting to I'm starting to change my mind. My God, I never heard him say anything remotely like that before. So I think the whole thing of going over there where people are going, oh, we're so woke now, I can't say anything, you know. I think it's actually shifting things enough so that my brother would actually say, hold on, hold on now a minute. I, 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 I'm I, actually changing my mind. I'm dead. I know, me too. I'm dead. I'm dead. Yeah, I know this brother. I love him so, so much. I'm I, amazing. Incredible. Yeah. What a day. What a day indeed when someone who's entrenched in their beliefs changes before our very eyes. And that capacity for transformation is also under the hood. Our brains own neuroplasticity, which allows for us to keep learning and evolving and adapting well past our years of youthful idealism. And whether you imagine history as a back-and-forth pendulum or a cyclical wheel of time or the arc of the moral universe, there is progress being made, slowly but surely. And it feels like we're heading to the right side of history. But it demands constant work and constant reinvention and constant cooperation, plus the wisdom of elders and the energy of youth. I think that I do believe on one hand, you know, Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I think that there are such amazing thinkers and artists that are going to reimagine the way the world and have been. And we, and it's in, it's in so many different ways, a new way of being and world making that I, I have, I just know that they are going to figure it out. It's not going to happen immediately. It's going to happen in fits and starts and push and pushes and pulls. And but I do believe that there are people and who are going to be able to make the world in their storytelling and in their writing and in their music that are going to make it happen. It's just going to happen because we're going to feel it here first and then we're going to act differently on the world. And we're actually now like the younger generation, even before living with the reality of the climate crisis and global heating are. Uh, they really grew up with a sense of not just we're going to operate a different way on the world. The world is is us. We are the world. We are the earth. And like, they are just gonna, I mean, they got to turn this ship around. I don't know. I mean, they don't have to. We all have to. But I know that's their uh, the major, major concern. I know of, of I hope, uh, folks younger than me. And that's how it but seems. It's always been thus. I mean, you know, we had yeah. the nuclear, we had nuclear, the nuclear holocaust waiting. I mean, I can't tell you, my father was born in 1898, how many yeah. times that they dealt with the, the end of the world, the yeah. end of the world as we know it, the great yeah. war, the other great war, the, you know, this mm -hmm. pandemic, that pandemic, you know, and, um, and so it's always like we're up against it, right? We are always up against mm -hmm. it. And I think of us as failing we better. We know what failure is. We know <laughs> yeah. that it's part of what athletes do. It's what artists do. It's what scientists do. You just slowly get a little less shit every time. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that that's the way we kind of need to to move forward collectively is to to work together to be and and actually fail failing they say is really you know if you just you know don't fail you just become closed off and uh, you know and that failing is actually an opportunity and that the people who do the most good it seems if you look at it in a way are the people who fail the most and then finally through failing you know like um like our doctor banting you know like who who you know just had nothing they threw him out of everywhere he couldn't get he just failed and failed and failed until he finally came up with the uh, the cure for diabetes which he then would not let anybody make any money on. He would never, he never made a penny on it. And then he insisted on going back, nobody wanted him to do it, to go back to the Second World War and actually went down in a plane over Twillingate, I think. But you know what I mean? A person who failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and gave us one of the, gave people who suffer from diabetes uh, the greatest gift, which now, you know, like uh, 
uh, other greedy people are, uh, you know, trying to charge people so much money that they have to sell their, you know, their kidney in order to get the uh, the uh, the insulin that they need. But that isn't the only part of the story. The other part of the story is Banting and Best, you know, spent their own money, developed this, and then would not take any profit from it and left it that nobody could take any profit from it. But then their it ran out of time, their copyright or whatever on it. And yeah. You know, so there's good stories. Like I love that that you're saying, Rick. It's like we, you, you, if you only decide to look one way, that's not the truth. That's not the truth. There is, there is both sides, right? I mean, I think I'm seeing that more as I get older. So I have a game show. <laughs> Speaking of failing better, I'd like to now take us through the um, the light and silly portion of 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 this podcast, which is uh, called the generation gap. It's a game show where we each try to find out how little we actually know about the pop culture of the other's generation. And I'm going to start okay. with uh, with you, Jamie. You're going to be first. All right. So you can probably see who this person is, Jamie. Berlin. Okay. And what hurricane is she talking about? I'm going to say Katrina. Correct. Okay. And uh, what show was she on on CNN? Larry King Lowell. There you go. There's Larry King. Okay. Who's this dude? Pope Ratzinger. Oh, you even know his last name, his real German name, not just, you I, know, Ben. Hi. I don't know his I don't know his uh <clears throat> magical pope name. Benedict. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> name three Rolling Stone songs. Um Satisfaction, Painted Black, and Beast of Burden. Wow. Okay, good. So you're you're kind of like not a gen, you're not even close to Gen Z. You're like thoroughly in the square of almost a, a Gen X. So <laughs> these are going to be easy yeah. for you. I'm 1990. I was born in 1990, but like one of my mom's good qualities is we were allowed to stay up late for the Oscars and we watched Entertainment Tonight every Amazing. night. Name a British Prime Minister from the last century, from the 20th century. Oh, David Cameron. Uh, oh, 20, 20th, 20th century, century from the last, yeah. Oh, for, uh, Tony Blair or Winston Churchill. Wow, you're so good. Oh my gosh, Mary, you're not going to stand a chance with your questions. Okay, uh, moving on. Name a dance that Madonna made famous. Well, she really took it from um, other communities, but voguing, you know. <laughs> uh, everything, all good artists uh, steal, right? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, name the husband of this famous TV show, I Love Lucy. Oh, Desi Arnaz. Wow, and his character name? Is it the same? Is it the, is Ricky it, Ricardo? I was gonna say. Wait, it's Ricky Ricardo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, okay. Uh, who were, um, who were the Flintstones inspired by? First of all, who are the Flintstones? What is what's the name of the couple? They're a modern Stone Age family, and it's Wilma and Fred. Wow. Okay. And inspired by which famous TV sitcom? I really, truly don't know at that time, but I might, I might say honeymoon, Honeymooners. I was yeah. just going to say, I guess it's Honeymooners. There you go. Okay. You know what, Jamie? I think you have passed with flying colors, and now we're about to um, see if we can knock some failure into Mary Walsh here, okay? Into Canadian icon you and You need so legend. much. Just wait. <laughs> no one okay. the news like her, so. I'm going, I'm going back. Can you do a little Vogue for us, uh, Mary Walsh? I saw you do some before. Yes, I was just say, say, helping Jamie with the voguing. Yeah. Strike yeah, a pose. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so Mary, here we go with the audiovisual portion. Mary Walsh, what is this flag? What is that flag? Yeah. Sheesh. I don't know. It's the transgender pride flag. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Who is this character? Uh, uh, Yoda, maybe. Yeah, you need to be a little more specific because uh, he's actually, okay. Uh, now, Jamie, yeah, Baby Yoda, there you go. From what TV show? Yeah. What? What TV show is he in? Baby Yoda. I don't know. Is he not on Star Wars or something? It's it's called The Mandalorian, which is one of many ah, of the, the Disney, the new Disney watched. world of Star Wars has about 30,000 ripoffs everywhere. And uh, bonus points for uh, for Jamie if you know his real name. Uh, he's called the child or Grogu. Grogu. Wow. My goodness. Jamie keeps <laughs> racking up the points. Okay. Mary, this is an easy one. Uh, who is this character? Oh, he's the guy. He's Harry Potter's... Um, 
Oh, Gilfoy, um, <laughs> whatever his name is. Uh, yeah. Close, yeah. close. Okay. Draco, yeah. Draco Malfoy. Gilfoy, is it? Malfoy. Gilfoy was close. Malfoy, yeah. You have yeah, points yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm going to open up this one. And who, which uh, famous singer was was this? Who played Hannah Montana? She's a famous pop singer now. Yeah, she's, and her father is a famous pop singer too. Yeah, this is what she looked like more recently. But that's yeah. uh, a... Millie. Um, yeah, like Stephen. Uh, you know, uh, you know, and he looks so, he's getting to look more and more like an old woman, like with long hair. Billy Ray oh, Cyrus. Yeah. Miley Cyrus. Cyrus. You yeah, called him yeah. Millie, but I'll accept Miley. That's good. Okay, okay good. Yeah. Again, a Star Wars. What uh, droid is this? Did I mention to you that I never go to Star Wars because I believe that Star Wars destroyed film as an art form and that it has never been worth going to since? Did I mention that to you? You haven't so kind of mentioned that I and is like, clearly, yeah. <laughs> maybe I haven't sunk that in. So I take it you don't know the name so of this I droid. I wouldn't know the name. On purpose, I would never know the name. So by principle, I'll give it just to you. On principle, I'm standing on my value. Okay. Uh, Jamie, what's he called? His name is BB-8, and I only know all this because I decided to shack up with a straight white millennial. Yes. And that's the only reason, only reason I know these things, and that's all he talks about. And wow. I love him. <laughs> yeah. And he's a poet, and he won oh, the Poetry God. Award. Come on. He can't I'm just joking. talk about Star Wars. <laughs> he honestly only day in, day out talks about Star Wars and the Titanic. And yes, then he writes by candlelight. Never bring him over. Never bring him over because I'll have to kill him. I'll have to, you know, garrote him. Name the Simpsons family. Oh, Marge and... Oh, my God. You know, I, I, I said... I, oh. I, I know. Marge and... and, and Go Think Homer and... There you go. Bert, 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 Brett, Brett, you know, and the Bart. little... And the little girl who plays the clarinet, or actually the saxophone, and then there's the baby. Lisa uh, and Maggie, but, uh, yeah. You know, I didn't really do well in school because as soon as I'm asked a direct question, my mind goes. <laughs> you know what I love though, Mary, is how you're always dancing around the correct wording. It's it's yeah. like dancing around the truth should be the name of maybe a new book or. or <laughs> Good idea, dancing around the. Truth. It is okay. uh, Simpson, of course, and Lisa, and and Homer, and. Um, Marge, yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, yeah. these are some texting abbreviations. I'd like you to tell me what they mean, okay? I-D-K. I don't know. L-M-K. No. Let me know. Oh, Marge? okay. Um, here's a tough one. S-M-H. No. I'm giving no. you a visual hint. Jamie, do you know? Oh, you got, you got it. You got it. There you go. Okay, good. Very nice. Okay. Um, Mary, on Tinder, the platform, the dating platform, if you swipe right, do you like someone or not like someone? I'm thinking you like someone if you swipe right. Ding, because ding. Right okay. And bad, right? Okay. Yeah. Finish this lyric. It's getting hot in here. It's getting hot in here. Is it Baby Shark? <laughs> Jamie, can you fill in the blank? The correct answer is, so take off all your clothes. Right, and that's just a, just a lyric, so we don't need to do any of that. I want to say how thankful I am, how grateful I am to know you just a little bit better, and uh, I, I wish you all the best on, on all your future endeavors. And I hope you had fun. Thank you so much for asking uh, me to do this, Mary. And Rick, I had a ball. Thank you so much. Hey, listen, thank oh, you. Oh, Miss Know-It-All. Miss Nobody <laughs> loves a know-it-all, you know, Jamie. <laughs> this has been Xing the Gap. Whether you're watching this as a video or listening to the podcast, it was all recorded and edited by me, Rick Miller, with multimedia from my team at Cadoons. This series is created in partnership with Leap, an online community where life experience meets innovation. For more info, visit cabby.com slash leap. Very special thank you to my two guests today, Mary Walsh and Jamie Pitt. You can find me at Rick Miller Actor on Twitter or Instagram or at rickmiller.ca. 
For more information about the Boom Trilogy, check out boomtheshow.com or kadoons.com. And remember, in a polarized world, you have a choice. Build a wall or build a bridge. Build bridges, not walls. Xing the gap.